I'm just going to take you now on a journey to back to where this all began. And as you can see by that beautiful picture there, I decided to take my mum on a really relaxing, tropical holiday vacation in a place called Boracay Island, which is in the Philippines. And at the time, my mum had been working really hard for a job called the Manly Daily Newspaper, and she was really stressed out. And I've been working in Japan for a year teaching conversational English. And I said to my mum, I want to take you on a relaxing, tropical holiday vacation. I promised her she'd be able to wind down and lose all her stress. And I promised her it would be a holiday that she was going to never, ever forget. And well, I feel I lived up to my part of that bargain at least, because she is very much remembering it. <laughs> this island was so beautiful. Like, the sand was like talcum powder. It was so gorgeous. But the thing is, it was actually very remote. It was located 950 miles south of Manila, and there was nothing on this island. No, just thatch bungalows on the beach, no electricity, no telephones, nothing. And so it was kind of a bit of an adventure holiday. And on the fourth day, we were told that there were natives around the other side of the island. And I don't know about you, I've never actually seen natives. And I thought, well, what do they look like? Are they running around with little loincloths on and spears? Because I wanted to really get some pictures of that. And so I said to my mum, why don't we hire a boat and we'll circumnavigate the island and pop around and see these natives. So I went down to the owner of this bungalows and I said to him, mum, can I hire you a catamaran? And he had a look at me and he went, mm, no, I don't think so. I think you could see his beautiful, shiny new catamaran just disappearing off into the sunset. And he goes, how about I rent you this? I was so desperate to do something adventurous that I agreed to hire that seven foot canoe. In the Philippines it's actually called a bunker. It was so narrow you couldn't actually sit inside it. They placed two planks of wood across the top of the benches and you sat on top of it. So can you imagine how narrow it was? It had the two outriggers on the side and they gave us a couple of oars. You know how in hindsight you look back and you've got 2020 vision? I should have noticed the white plastic bucket in the bottom of the boat as a sign that something would go wrong but I never noticed that. But off we went, Mum and I, and um, yeah, it was leaking. Not, not very much, but it was leaking enough for us to have to use this white plastic bucket to bail water. And my mum really doesn't like the ocean at all, so she'd had enough after a while, and she said, Michelle, I want to go back. And I'm like, Mum, you're going to just totally ruin the whole day. Come on. And she stayed out for a few more minutes, but then she suddenly saw this gigantic stingray just swim right underneath the bunker, and she was like, that's it, Michelle, drop me back off to shore. <laughs> you know, she was freaking out. And so I dropped her back off to shore, and I'll never forget her last words to me. Her last words were, please, Michelle, don't go out too far. For anyone here under 40, listen to your mother. <laughs> you know, she really does my best. Anyway, I didn't listen to my mum, and I was off. Now, if you can imagine that the island is shaped like that, while I stayed within the tranquil waters of the lagoon, I was completely safe. But the moment I tried to round the point to get around the other side of the island, all the ocean currents from behind the island began to sweep me out to sea. And it happened so quickly. Before I knew it, I just could not get back to this island. I was like paddling furiously trying to get back to shore. But I just could not get back. I, um, there was the adjacent island, which you can see there, called Cataclan, and there was a lighthouse on it. And I made a decision that at 4.45 I would make a swim to that island because I'd studied the maps before I went to this island and I knew that there was no more land. Like if I couldn't get back to that land, there was like a thousand kilometre stretch of open ocean between that island and Malaysia. So if I didn't make it back to that island, I knew I was dead for sure. So at 4.45 I made a decision to make a two kilometre swim to that, to that island. And I put on my mask and my snorkel and my flippers and I hopped onto the outrigger of the canoe and I prepared to jump. But before I did, I heard this just incredibly loud, audible voice call out to me and say, don't leave the boat. Can you imagine how relieved I was? I just thought, thank you. My friend John's coming in his launch to rescue me. And I was expecting, I thought I turned around and there's no John. And I thought, well, I know somebody just told me not to leave the boat, but I thought, well, I, I'm not hallucinating. I've only been out here five hours. Anyway, I dismissed the voice because I knew, what, again, if I didn't leave the boat, I would be lost at sea. 
So again, I hopped onto the outrigger of the canoe and prepared to jump. And again, this voice that was so powerful and boomingly loud called out to me and said, don't leave the boat. I got such a fright, I fell face first into the water. And when I crawled back into that canoe, I'm telling you, I was more afraid of what this voice might do to me if I disobeyed than actually the thought of spending that night at sea. But then I have never, ever spent a night at sea. I can't begin to tell you, unless you here have been in the Navy, would you imagine what it's like to spend a night in the ocean? As I moved into deep water, the waves just got bigger and bigger and bigger until I was terrified to look at them. They were just these mountainous walls of water coming towards me and crashing into the canoe. All I could do was bail water frantically just to stop the craft from sinking. And all I could do is just hold on to it as I rode the, the waves. Of it. it was like being in a car of one of those roller coasters. And all night there was just thunder and lightning and torrential rain pouring on me. Um, I saw this enormous wave just coming towards me and it hit the boat with such force I was just flung out and I could feel myself drowning. It is the most terrifying feeling to drown. You're like, you don't know which way is up. And I finally got to the surface of the water and I managed to find that canoe. But it had actually vacuum sealed itself to the ocean. It, I think it was because it had the outriggers on the side, it just had vacuum sealed itself. And no matter what I tried, I could not flip that craft over. You know, I didn't know it then, but that I would hold on to the side of that canoe in the middle of the South China Sea for the next two days, waiting to be rescued. Sometimes it's really good that you don't know the future. But I didn't know that at the time. So I just held on. And then a short time after, there was like kind of a little mini air bubble just popped from outside underneath the boat. And all my belongings, that must have been kind of, that I pushed right into the tip of the boat, just all started to come out. I mean, obviously some of the heavier stuff just sunk straight to the bottom. But I saw my water bottle. I had a sports bottle of water like that and it was bobbing along the waves. And I, didn't know how long I was going to be out there, but I knew I needed water. So I went to swim to get this bottle of water. And again, I heard this voice. And this voice said to me, grab the flippers. And I'm like, why am I going to need flippers? As if I'm going to be doing any snorkeling now, you know, I'm in the middle of the ocean. And so again, I naturally thought, go and get the water. So I did what I thought was rational and I went to swim to get the water. And again, this voice just authoritatively told me, grab the flippers. So I just did what I was told. And it was a pretty difficult task to try and put these flippers on the middle of the ocean with nothing to hold on to. But I managed to get both of them on. But I have to tell you, for the next two days, as I literally died of dehydration, my tongue was so thick and swollen by the time they found me. I had second degree burns and I kept thinking, why didn't I grab that water instead of these flippers? But if you take nothing else away from today, take away this. Sometimes God's going to ask you to do things that are beyond what is rational to your mind. Beyond what makes sense. And that's where you just have to have faith. I'll tell you later why those flippers were intrinsic in saving my life. Had I grabbed that water bottle as I thought was necessary, not those flippers, I would not be standing here telling you that story today. But see, God knew I would need those flippers. Anyway, that day I just waited, expecting any moment my mum was coming to rescue me. I mean, you, in the height of a crisis, you always expect your parents are coming to rescue you, right? And I just kept looking up into the sky, expecting there'd be a plane or a helicopter. I kept looking across the water, expecting any moment there'd be a boat coming towards me and my mum would say, it's okay, Michelle, you know, I'm here to rescue you. But that moment just never, ever came. And I can't begin to tell you the fear as I watched the sun go down in the sky on the second night. I thought, I made it through one night, how can I ever make it through another? Now I'm holding on to just a piece of wood. And my mum was not coming to get me. And I suddenly realised, I'm probably going to die tonight. You know, it's, all of us are going to die, but it's not many of us that actually look into the face of death and know, I could die in the next minute. And it's at that point that you go, where am I going next? And that was the really scary thing for me, because I thought, if I die in the next couple of minutes, I really have no idea where I'm going next. And it was at that point that I realised that there was a heaven 
and there was a hell. I knew that much. There was an up and there was a down. And I had a destination, I had a decision, and I had a choice. And so did each and every one of you. Well, as for me, I, I didn't want to go down because I'd heard about that place and it didn't sound too fabulous. Now, you've got to remember that I went out there having never read a Bible and not knowing God. My mum is Jewish and she married my dad, who was Catholic, so you can imagine I grew up a little bit confused. And, but, <laughs> but, you know, my dad had taken me to Sunday school a few times. And as I sat there trying to rack my brain to think, is there anything at all I can remember about this God? Of all things, a scripture from way back when I was seven popped into my mind. And the scripture was, nobody shall enter this kingdom of heaven but through me. I cannot tell you how amazed I was that from way back when I was seven, I would remember a scripture. And I knew the me in that scripture, that was Jesus. And then something else amazing happened. Like my mum flew from Sydney and I flew from Japan and we met in Singapore. And, you know, my mum was quite radiant and excited and I'm like, aren't you supposed to be stressed and tired? You know, because that's the way I was expecting her to turn up. And she was single at the time and I said, what's going on with you? And I said, oh, you've been a man, haven't you? Because I thought that's why she had this glow about her. And she goes, well, sort of, but not the kind of man you think. I was thinking, well, how many other kind of men are there? How many maybe I'm missing something? And she said, um, Michelle, I've come to know Jesus as my Messiah. And no, that wasn't the word I said, I can tell you. I'm like, I'm going to be stuck on an island for three weeks with somebody who's going to talk about Jesus. I was like, Mum, just stop right there. Um, you can't believe in Jesus because you're Jewish. Um, and she goes, well, I do. I do, and I know that he is my Messiah. I said, well, don't tell anybody we know because I'm going to literally feel like a pork chop in, in a synagogue, you know, if you go around telling everybody that. But she goes, Michelle, I just want to tell you this one thing. I'm not going to preach to you, but let me say one thing. Perhaps one day God may have to bring you right down on your knees. And as a mother, I hope that never happens. But if it does, remember God's hand is always outstretched to you. And he's waiting for the day that you'll cry out to him for help and say, God, I need you. Save me. And she said, Michelle, I promise you he will. I said, okay, Mum, I'll keep that in mind. Four days later, I was in the South China Sea. And in the very predicament she told me I'd be in. So I thought, okay, the Catholic Church says it's Jesus. And Mum says it's Jesus. This Jesus must be the only way to get to heaven. And so without knowing Jesus or without knowing God, I just made a very quick statement and said to God, God, I really don't know you and I don't know your son Jesus, but if I die in the next couple of minutes, can you take me to heaven? I believe in you. And I believe it was in that moment of that very simple prayer that I was both physically and spiritually saved. And somebody said that I had the longest water baptism in history. And who knows? Maybe that's also true. I did have a real one when I got back, just in case you're asking. I had a real one. You know, so many amazing things happened to me out there. And obviously, I don't have time to tell you all about them in one night. But I do want to share this to you because what happened to me is not for me. It's that I may come and share this with you because I made a promise to God out in that ocean. I said, if you save my life, I will spend the rest of my life telling other people about you. And so I looked up into the sky and I thought, well, hang on, God's going to save my life. There must be something really huge that he wants from me for that because, you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch in this world, probably not even with God. And so I had to ask him a question. I said, could I just ask you, am I going to die? And I didn't actually expect somebody might answer me, but this voice, again, this voice just boomed down and said to me, you are not going to die. I was so amazed. I was like, could you say that again? <laughs> and <laughs> I want to make sure I got it right. And again, he said to me, you are not going to die. And I was so excited, I was like, I'm not going to die, I'm not going to die, I'm not going to die. And then I'm like, oh, hang on a second, hang on. Why would he want to save my life? 
what does he want from me? And I, I try to think in my own logical sense about what would be the most dramatic thing that God could ask from me. And I thought, he's going to ask me to join the nunnery. That's all I could think. I thought, if he saves my life, I'm going to have to go straight to the nunnery as soon as I get rescued. But that's how much I didn't know God. And so I said to him, well, what do you want in return for this gift of life? Because surely there's something. And he said the strangest thing to me. He said, I want 100% of your faith in me. Well, I really didn't know what that was. And I was in the middle of the ocean. And to be honest, you're really ready to say anything to save your own life. So I said to him, okay, you've got 100% of my faith. It was after that that I realised God knew what I was thinking because he said to me, not 90, I told you 100% faith. I have never been so scared. I'm like... <coughs> and so I had to try and find this faith. Now, you've got to imagine, I'm in the middle of the ocean. It's completely dark. I have not seen land for two days. And someone that's invisible is asking me to have 100% faith in them. I had to ask for help and I said, God, you're going to have to help me. And in that moment, I felt this like electrical, supernatural charge go through me. And I don't know how I believed, but I believed that God would save my life. I mean, I was trying to work it out. I was like, you know how we try and help God along? We try and think, well, how are you going to do it? I was thinking, well, are you going to send a big bird down from the sky to pluck me from the water and drop me off onto another island or something? I just couldn't work out how God was going to do it. But in the end, I just said, I have 100% faith in you. And I believe that's what God is asking you to have. 100% faith in him. Not in how he can fix your circumstances, not in how he can do a miracle, not necessarily how he can bless you, but 100% faith in him who rescues you. And that's what he's asking from you also. Shortly after this, try and imagine, it's going to be hard, but imagine that the, the hull of the boat is upturned, okay? One of the outriggers has broken off and the other one's breaking away from the side. And I have my back pressed as hard as I can against the upturned hull and my flippered feet pushed in a polar opposite just so I didn't have to have my legs dangling in the water. And it was so dark. This night was incredibly dark. So that when I suddenly saw this white opalescent light filled the water, I just automatically looked up and what I saw was both beautiful but absolutely terrifying. I just looked straight down and I said, God, when I look up, can they just no longer be there because it was really, really scary. But when I looked up, they were still there. There was three of the most toweringly tall beings standing on the ocean. They were just huge. And you know, the strange thing was, well, at least to me, was the three of them stood together very stoically, like that, and they looked like soldiers standing together on the ocean. There was no division between the three. I remember looking at them thinking, they look like they're in a mold. The three were one, and the one were three. And the light that shone from them. I've got to tell you, the Bible is true. It says, the eye has not seen nor the ear heard of the reward that God has waiting for those that love him. And the light that filled the ocean was spectacular. And then suddenly I felt something very heavy leaning on my back and all my spine began to just tingle and I went to look around but then I thought, no, I, I'm, not, I'm just not going to have a look around. And then all the air was just filled with this incredible electricity and I reached my hand out to touch the air and it went zzzz, and I got like an electrical shock on my hands and then I looked down to see the wings of an angel had enfolded me like that. It had come from behind and just wrapped its wings around me. I didn't even know or believe that things like this existed. The wings of this angel were so beautiful, I'll try and explain it to you. Just imagine a dragonfly, but a gigantic dragonfly. Every beam, you could like, they were solid and yet I could see right through them. And every beam in them was perfectly illuminated. You know when you pour petrol, you can see all the colours of the rainbow? They were perfectly white, but yet every colour of the rainbow was through the wings of this angel. It was amazing. <laughs> then these three beings disappeared and the wings, um, like I could no longer see the wings of this angel. And that night I'd be picked up and just thrown into the ocean and lose contact with this boat. Can you even begin to imagine what it would be like to be just doggy paddling around in the middle of the South China Sea with nothing to hold on to? 
And you know that every time that night, either I banged into that boat or it banged back into me. And that's actually not scientifically possible because the waves were only going one way and that boat could not have come backwards, but that's what happened. But what was more amazing than that was that all night that angel held me in its wings. I couldn't see it, but it actually held me up in the ocean and stopped me from drowning. And I want you to know that Michelle Hamilton is not special. The God that came to the South China Sea to rescue me is the same God here rescuing you too. And you don't have to surely be as stupid as me to rent a seven-foot canoe and get lost at sea for these things to happen. All throughout the Bible, God says he has his angels as his ministers and his messengers. And you would not actually be sitting here tonight if God had not already intervened on a number of occasions in your life and saved you. Am I right? And protected you. I don't think you've been here already. You probably don't even see the amount of times that God's angels have already protected you. But I want to say this one thing to you. How often do you feel like your life is a storm? You know, I've had actually more storms here on dry land than I ever did out in that ocean. And doesn't it feel like sometimes your life is just raging around you out of control? And those waves that smashed on me literally, they just keep smashing on you and pushing you down, don't they? You know, sometimes they're the waves, the financial burden, they just crash on you over and over again and you're trying to get to the surface of your life and another one just crashes upon you. Maybe it's an addiction that you just can't conquer that smashes you down every time you think you've got a hold on it. Maybe it's family problems. Maybe it's unemployment. But I want to say this to you. Even when you feel like your life is a storm and your life is raging around you out of control and you're drowning, that God said he'd be your fortress, your strength, and your deliverer. And you may not literally see those angels as I have done, but they are holding you up in your life, and they are keeping you safe because that's the Jesus that I know, and that's the Jesus that knows you also. Never, ever forget that he is with you. Shortly after this, I can't say exactly when, um, but that next day, I finally saw land. And it was very unexpected. There were just four very, very small islands in front of me. And, um, well, I was very excited because I wasn't going to get picked up by a bird and dropped off at these islands. I was going to actually literally get there myself. And actually, I would have done a really good job on that, jo on that show Survivor because I already completely worked out what I was going to do when I got to the island. I'd already in my mind built the Swiss Robinson Chalet and done everything and how I was going to get water and coconuts and all that. And I was about five kilometers away from making it to these islands when I looked and I saw fins on the ocean. And I'm looking at these fins going, jump, just jump. Tell me that you're dolphins, show me that you're dolphins. And I was just praying that they'd make that nice arching motion that dolphins make, but they weren't. There was two sharks. I didn't know I was bleeding into the ocean at that time. I would only find that out later. But obviously these sharks knew and they were coming straight towards me. You know, I don't know if you've ever been in a similar circumstance, but my heart just stopped and my mind was telling my body, jump onto the boat and I just couldn't move. But I suddenly just snapped out of it and I threw myself onto the hull of the subterranean boat. But it was covered in a sort of slimy green algae. So when I lay on it, on my stomach with just one remaining outlet that I hold onto, the waves from behind me just swept me like a torpedo straight into the path of these sharks. So not only were they coming towards me, but I was making it like a beeline straight for them. And all I could do was swim back to the boat and I kept telling myself, don't splash, don't splash, don't splash. And I expected any moment to feel the serrated teeth of the jaws of those sharks just clamp on to the back of my leg. When again I heard this voice, this very loud, audible voice call out to me and said to me, fear not, they will not hurt you. And I'm like, there's sharks, I'm in the ocean, I'm going to be eaten. And again, this voice, do you know God spoke and said to me everything twice? I don't know if that means I'm really slow or really hard of hearing, but everything was said to me twice. Again, he said to me, fear not, they will not hurt you. And then God issued me a challenge. He said, now where's that 100% faith you promised me? Oh, I just 
can't tell you how hard that was, but I had like 10 seconds to make a decision. So I said, God help me have 100% faith. And again, this just supernatural, electrical type of force just flooded through me until I was able to look and just say, God, I have 100% faith, save me. And in the moment I did that, I saw an absolute supernatural miracle happen before my very eyes. Those sharks just swiveled and turned and swung away in the totally opposite direction as if they had never seen me at all. And I'm going to tell you, I was amazed by this God. I was like, you are so amazing. And he is an amazing God. But I've found since I came back to dry land, there's still sharks. Yeah. And you know something, I found that the hungry human sharks in life are so much more vicious than actual sharks. And I want to say to you, how often do you feel like you're surrounded on every side by those hungry human sharks just waiting to devour you and tear you apart? You know the ones I mean, don't you? The ones that are at your job, that are always trying to say nasty things about you to your boss. You know, the ones that are always trying to undermine you and criticise you and tear you down and rip you apart. Sometimes those hungry human sharks, they even live in the same house as you. But you know, God would say the same thing to you that he said to me. Fear not, they will not hurt you. I'm not saying they won't try. That's their job. That's their assignment. But greater is Jesus in you than he that is in the world. And you need to stand firm and say, you have no power over me. And I know it's hard, because I've been attacked many times back here on dry land, but you know something? I'm still standing here, and I'm living proof that God is stronger. He has already overcome the world. About half an hour after this, I saw a boat coming towards me. And I was like, okay, now this is really how I'm going to be rescued. And so I took off this little t-shirt that I had and I was waving it around like a lasso. And there was just nobody on board. You know, you expect on a big fishing vessel to see people. And there was just nowhere, any, nobody anywhere. I thought, well, maybe they put the boat on autopilot and they're downstairs drinking and playing cards. I don't know where these people were. But... The boat came close enough to me for me to be able to call out for help. And so as the boat passed me, I went to quote, help. And I realized I had no voice. Like three days of having not a single drop of water and being like just out there in the ocean, I could not call out for help. And I had to watch my rescue boat just keep on going. And I'm like, but God, this is a good plan. You know, here I am, here's the boat. You know, like, what's plan B? <laughs> But I had to just keep on watching that boat go in the opposite direction. But by this stage, I'd learned to exercise this 100% faith. And so I just kept looking at the back of that boat saying, somebody come on board and see me. Somebody just walk onto the deck of this boat and see me. But they kept on going in the opposite direction, kept on going, kept on going. And I thought, OK, well, then it's not going to happen. But I don't want you to be like me. Don't give up. Because it was as I gave up that somebody came onto the deck of that vessel, pointed directly at me into the water and waved. So sometimes you know you're just about to give up and that's when your victory happens. Don't give up. And so, can you imagine what a bizarre moment it was though? I asked this boy later, his name is Nelson Sarita, what made you do that? And he said, God told me he was a Christian. God told him, go up onto the deck of the ship and look into the ocean. He could have said, I'm busy. He could have said, what for? But he obeyed and he saved my life. <laughs> so he pointed at me and he waved. And so I waved back. <laughs> and then he waved again. And I'm like, yeah, I can see you. Can you see me? And then all his friends suddenly came onto the, you know, his not comrades, because that's Russian. Where, what would they be? Mates. Mateship. Well, you know, those people that are on the boat anyway. And they were all waving and they were beckoning for me to swim to their vessel. And I'm like, well, can't you come and get me? Because, you know, I'm, I'm the one that's been out here for three days. They, they just kept beckoning for me to come and swim. And I realised after about 15 minutes of them beckoning me, they're not coming to get me. 
And so I had to leave that boat, which... It was just a piece of wood by this stage, but I'd hung on to that for three days. And swim through shark-infested waters to get there. But I was going to do it. So I went to swim. And you know, I realised I couldn't use my arms. Three days of paddling, bailing water, holding on, swimming, my arms would not work. And I kept going under the water and almost drowning. I thought, I can't bear to see my rescue boat right there and I can't swim. And you know something, then God showed me what to do. He didn't speak to me audibly this time, he just spoke to me in my heart, said, lie on your back and use your flippered feet to propel you. And because I put those flippers on, two days prior, I was able to get the half mile all the way to this vessel, lying on my back and using my flipper feet to propel me all the way there. See, that's why you've got to have faith, even when it doesn't make sense. I finally got to this um, vessel, there was all these gorgeous little Filipino bases and they threw this big rope down the side of the boat and they said to me, you climb up. And I thought, what do you people think I am, Tarzan's wife or something? I've just swung all the way to this rescue boat. Now they want me to scale this rope. All I could do was just hold on to the gear life as they pulled me up over the side and I, I never forget the rusty steel fragments from this fishing vessel just ripping straight down my second degree burns as they pulled me up over the side. And I stood on the deck of the boat and I was just like, I just want to collapse. And I looked at this boy and he looked at me and he pointed like this and he said, Serena, Serena, it's an Americano mermaid. <laughs> I, I didn't have this friend's laugh and I thought, an American mermaid? Yeah, you, you people have been drinking. But then I looked down and... They found me in the middle of the South China Sea with long blonde hair and I was only wearing a bikini and I still had these clippers on. And you know, they, they said it was not until they took off my money belt that was still attached to my waist and took out my passport did they actually really believe I was a mere mortal. You know, I collapsed into unconsciousness and when I woke up, this boy Nelson Zareda, who spoke quite good English, was right in front of me and I'll never forget what he said to me. I turned to him and I said, thank you so much. Do you realise that you saved my life? And he looked at me and said, it was never me that saved your life. It wasn't even you. Don't you realise it was God? And I'm like, the first words I hear out of somebody's mouth is about God. And I thought, you're right. It was never you. It was never me. But it was as the Bible says, it was by grace through faith that I was saved. And that not of myself, it was a gift from God. So my poor mother, I was going to take her on a relaxing, tropical holiday vacation. She did everything she could. You can remember, I went off with the money belt wrapped around my waist. And in the money belt was both the passports, all the traveler's checks, and all the cash. I left her on an island with no money and no ability to call for help. She got out of the fishing vessel, they couldn't find me. Then somebody on the island lent her 1,200 American dollars in cash and she got the aerial plane. But you know something? It's like looking for a needle in a haystack. She came back and they couldn't find me. And it was at that point she had to believe that they weren't going to find me. This was the third day. So she went into a little church on the island and she sat down. And you can imagine three months earlier, she'd just given her life to Jesus. As a Jewish woman, she's going like, God, why have you done this to me? I gave you my life and I entrusted all my children's lives into your hands. What now? You've stolen one of them away from me. You don't make any sense. She said she wrestled and fought with God. But she came to the place that we all must come to. And please listen to this. Surrender. It's the hardest thing in the world to do when it's your children. It's to surrender them. It's to hand them completely over to God and say they are not mine. And that's what God said to her. And she saw a vision of Abraham walking up Mount Moriah, surrendering his son. And she knew that's what God was asking her to do, to surrender. So she said to God, I do not understand why you're doing this to me. And he said to her, you only have a piece of this puzzle. I have the whole plan. Trust me. It's the same with you. You only have a piece of the puzzle. You don't have the whole plan. And at that point, he said, now open your Bible. And she opened her Bible and just fell on this scripture, Psalm 46. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. 
God shall help her just at the break of dawn. Isn't that an amazing scripture? <laughs> now, she didn't still believe I was alive, but she believed that I'd accepted Jesus when I was out in that ocean and that I'd gone to heaven. And that's really what she took from that. She then went back to Manila. It was a Sunday. And I arrived back in Manila at the same time, still on this rescue vessel. Because of the storms in the region, they hadn't even been able to radio ahead and tell anybody I was alive. I kept saying, can somebody please call my mother and they said the radio is broken. We both arrived in Manila at the same time. I was taken to the Coast Guard station and my mum was taken to the Australian Embassy. And they wanted to ask me all these questions about how did it happen, what happened. I said, can you just let me have a phone? And there, I said, just can I ring the Australian Embassy? And I rang, but because it was a Sunday, they were closed. And so I had to leave a message. And I'll never forget the message I left. Was, I said, can somebody please tell my mum, Rochelle Hamilton, at Willie's Bungalows, number four, mum, I'm not dead, I'm alive. And I hung up not knowing when she'd get that message. She was then picked up by Australian Embassy officials, and again, because the embassy was closed, they took her back to their home. And he sat her down, and there's no easy way to tell somebody that your daughter's dead. But he said to her, she's been gone four days in tropical storms, in shark and pirate infested oceans in a seven foot canoe. I can give you no hope. He said, but if her body washes up onto a beach or somewhere, do you want us to keep her here in the Philippines or send her back to you in Australia? She said she could not answer his question. But her daughter was now going to be put in a body bag and she said she couldn't answer his question. And you know, by the grace of God, she never ever had to. Because mm. suddenly the phone rang and she said, well, could you just wait a minute? He said, can you wait a minute? I've got to answer that. And she said, he came flying down the stairs saying, at three at a time saying, I cannot believe I'm telling you this, but your daughter, Michelle, she's not dead. She's alive. She's been rescued by Filipino fishermen and get this for amazing. He said, I'll take you to her now because they put me in a hotel room just around the corner. <laughs> can you believe that? God He's a God of awesome power. He's a God of incredible mercy. But I have found him to be, to me, a God of the most amazing grace. And as I said, I've been through some tough stuff since then. My son at two was diagnosed with autism. And I have to tell you, I went through some really, really dark days where I, I lost my faith in God. I could not go to church. And you think after all that I've seen and all that I've heard, that I could remain faithful to this God. But you know something? I couldn't. But I want to tell you something about this God that I've met. And by the way, my son who is here tonight, 15 and a half, is completely restored from the autism now. God has healed. But it wasn't an instant healing. It wasn't an instant healing. But I want to say the most beautiful thing I found about Jesus is even when you stop having 100% faith in him, he never stops having 100% faith in you. He will finish the good work that he started in you. So don't think, even if you feel really bad about yourself and you feel like, you know, I'm no good, I'm worthless, I can't live up to that, God has a plan for you and he will finish that perfect plan because he has 100% faith in you. Close your eyes and just bow your heads for a moment if you would. I just want to tell you that this same Jesus who is so kind, who is so merciful, who over the years has shown me such favour and actually when I've been at my worst and my, you know, not when I've been at my best, but he's just shown me how much he loves me. And you know something, I know he loves you that much also. And the same God that had his hand outstretched to me in the ocean, that said to me, just reach up and take a hold of his hand of faith. And he's saying the same thing to you tonight. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what rotten things that you've done. You're the reason Jesus allowed himself to be hung on the cross and died. You are the reason. And he sacrificed his life for you that you may have eternal life. And I want to say to you, and I really want you to hear this, is that you do not know the hour of your death. Don't think you have next month, next year. Do not reject the Son of God 
and say, maybe, look, tomorrow I'll accept you, or how about next week, or maybe later. If I'd gotten lost out in that ocean when I got lost and God had not intervened, I would be not only dead, but I would not be going to heaven. So I just want to say to each one of you tonight, if you do not know that your destination is heaven, if you do not know that your name is written in the book of life, then tonight is the night to say yes to Jesus. Jesus said, God said, if you would say yes to my son, I will say yes to you. But if you will reject my son Jesus, then I will also reject you. So I'm just going to say, if there's anybody here with every eye closed and every head bowed, this is a decision between you and God. It may be the last time anybody ever asks you this question. Do you know that your destination is heaven? If you are not sure or you have backslidden, all you need to do is raise your hand and God will see that hand and he will go ahead and write your name in the book of life. So just raise your hand for God to see. It's not for me to see, it's for God to see. Just raise your hand and say, I want to accept this Jesus today. God bless you. God bless you. Since Michelle's traumatic experience and miraculous rescue, she and her mother have not returned to Boracay Island. Upon arriving in Manila, they were inundated with interview requests from newspapers, magazines and television networks. Within a short time, the media had dubbed her the Aussie Mermaid. Following a special ceremony honouring the crew of the rescue ship FV Alistar, Michelle and Rochelle returned to Australia where they were reunited with Rochelle's two younger daughters, Angeline and Natalie. During the following 18 months, Michelle and Rochelle wrote the account of their ordeal, giving testimony to God's grace and power.
Your name is Savior, Messiah, the one who has saved us from death. Jesus, beautiful, you continue to show us your grace. Your name is Counselor, Father, your name is still holy today. Redeemer, Prince of Peace, the Lamb who has died in my Your name is Counselor, my Father. Your name is still holy today. My Redeemer, the Prince of Peace, the Lamb who has died in my place. And I will remember. The Son of God, the Son of Man, the one who has said.